You're listening to Tech Policy Grind, a podcast from the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, where we hammer out the latest at the intersection of law and technology. My name is Emery Rohn, and today, Joe Jerome joins us as we talk to Fred Jennings, Associate Corporate Counsel at GitHub, about bug bounty programs, the pitfalls businesses need to keep in mind while setting up bug bounty programs of their own, and the challenges and highs of working at one of the coolest Microsoft acquisitions yet. Seriously, though, GitHub is an awesome company, and I hope you enjoyed this peek into what it's like working in-house at a tech company that's managed to grow to more than 30 million active users while still sticking to its open source heart and soul. Before we jump into that chat, though, I hope you're keeping an eye on the Internet Law and Policy Foundry Twitter at ILP Foundry and our website at ilpfoundry.us. Applications for the 2019 Class of Fellows will go live this Friday, March 15th, and will be accepting applications until late April. Students, early career professionals, folks in the tech law and policy space, I hope we see your application. I've had some incredible opportunities and have met some awesome friends and colleagues through the Foundry, so what are you waiting for? All right, with all that said, you know the drill. Enjoy this chat with Fred Jennings, Associate Corporate Counsel at GitHub. Well, for our listeners, we have Fred Jennings here. He is Associate Corporate Counsel at GitHub. He's also an Internet Law and Policy Foundry fellow, a fellow fellow, uh, and we are thrilled to have you here today. Fred, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Emery. Thrilled to be here and good to talk to you. So just to give the obligatory disclaimer, I am not speaking on behalf of GitHub, any other individual or client, and this is not legal advice, and I'm not your lawyer. Yeah. Can I ask you, Fred, how many different hats do you wear? Um, So it depends on what's on fire that day. Um, (laughs) uh, GitHub's legal team is roughly split up into three different kind of fairly permeable sections, uh, and I'm on the legal support team. So uh, it's the sort of dispute resolution escalation side things um, along with uh, things like security breach analysis. So it's, it's a lot of... It's not a very predictable set of hats, uh, but it leads to like a pretty nice breadth of, of tasks. So I guess uh, for our listeners that aren't aware of GitHub, the two of you that are out there, uh, do you want to give us a little bit of background on the organization? Sure. So GitHub is a, uh, it's a lot of things actually, but sort of at, at its core, it's a tool for doing dis- uh, distributed version controlled uh, software de- development. Um, so that means that we are at once a file host, a project management platform, and to some degree, insofar as you know, people get talking on this platform, a social network as well. So it's it's a very interesting place to be from a you know, sort of legal perspective. How did you get to GitHub? Uh, through a winding and sometimes strange course of of minor career changes, but uh, most immediately. <laughs> uh, Previous to this, I was at Tor Eklund Law for about four and a half years, and that's an East Coast firm that, or actually, sorry, bi-coastal firm um, that does a lot, sort of, probably is best known for their cybercrime defense work, but also does a lot of copyright and trademark litigation, uh, commercial litigation, and consulting, mostly in the, like, technology and um, information security spaces. The other cool thing about GitHub, I think, is the fact that it is sort of... Uh, proudly open source and sort of proudly copy left almost. Would you do you think that's a fair description? I think that's fair. Yeah, I mean it, they, you know, have I think from well you know many years before I arrived there have been strongly open source, uh, strongly sort of pro transparency, and you know more more recently that's translated into some phenomenal efforts by GitHub's policy team um, on various copyright issues. I think. Probably most notably, um, we've been doing a lot of advocacy on Article 13 in the EU. Yeah, absolutely. We spoke briefly uh, about Article 13 with Daphne Keller a few weeks ago when we were talking about the upcoming terrorist content regulation. She described uh, the terrorist content regulation as Article 13 on steroids. Um, I would agree with that. But that isn't to say that the Article 13 uh, copyright directive isn't itself fairly awful in and of itself and doesn't deserve its own discussion. Do you want to give us a little bit of background on what's going on in the EU and that you've been working on? Sure. Um, I, I've been working near the people working on this at GitHub, so I don't, have, I don't have a whole great deal to say, but I think the most troubling aspect of it for kind of anyone in the content creation or content serving worlds is um, 
there are various aspects of the current draft of Article 13, which would require things like proactive content filtering for copyright uh, infringement prevention. And, you know, these are things that from a sort of perfect enforcement perspective might look appealing, but from a practical impact perspective are disastrous if they're even reliably achievable. Yeah, I think that there's a big question of actually, is it even workable? Is it is it something that would break the internet because the you know, that it breaks the sort of legal frameworks we have depended on, or is it going to break the internet because it's literally just impossible to implement? Right. I mean, you know, I, I think I, I would be worried about seeing something, you know, sort of like Tumblr or Craigslist in the wake of of uh, FOSTA where, mm -hmm. you know, the compliance solution is just take it all down as opposed to, you know, an actual workable process. Do you have an example of how, like, I guess I'm curious how infringing material could show up on GitHub? I guess I'm trying to work through a, a, a use case or a, a, a concern that you guys would actually have. Um, you know, for our sort of probably the most common situation, you know, if I find a piece of code, I... You know, there is there is nothing that would stop me from, you know, as a GitHub user, from hosting that on my own repository, and you know, it's it's th things like that where you know, if if, I, if it's taken from outside of GitHub, there's not any kind of you know, just like a YouTube video or you know, an image on Instagram. There's no way to know beforehand before someone you know writes in and complains uh, whether that's infringing or not. To rewind just a little bit, is GitHub a nonprofit or a business or both? <laughs> no, no, they're 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 for profit. Bought and bought and acquired by Microsoft, I do believe. Yep. Yep, oh right, recently. yeah, yeah, that was some big news. Was it just last year? It was. Um, I think it was sometime last summer that the deal was announced as you know a thing that was going to happen, and they they closed on the deal um, late October of of last year. Fred, how about you just tell us what what the life of a, of a GitHub lawyer is like on a day to day basis? Like, what all yeah, are you covering? So, I, so on, on the legal support team, uh, a lot of what I'm covering is sort of the day to day fires that come up. Um, that can be anything from you know DMCA takedown notice that we've gotten, where there's a difficult issue that's been posed and thus it's been escalated up to legal, through to you know GDPR or HIPAA, HIPAA analysis for a security issue. Uh, so it, it runs a pretty wide swath. Um, I'd say probably the highest volume things that I'm doing are in no particular order, uh, responding to uh, copyright and trademark reports that get escalated, uh, dealing with uh, user data requests that come in from you know subpoenas and 27033 orders and things like that. And then, I don't know, I'd, I'd actually be hard pressed to pick what the third one would be. It uh, really varies from day to day and week to week. So I, I, you know, I'm curious. This isn't maybe a question about your day to day job, but just sort of the general philosophy of GitHub. Um, I, I will readily admit I'm a luddite, and so I've been trying to teach myself exactly how things even work on GitHub. Um, and yet I, I'm sort of incredible. I'm increasingly impressed that like it's being used as an avenue for. Um, policymakers to engage in tech policy. Um, and I, I think a, an example of that is uh, the Los Angeles Department of Transportation putting its mobility mobility data specification yep. on GitHub and then just sort of like opening it up to comments. Yeah, there, there's that. There, there's also a handful of um, both US-based and international uh, regulatory bodies and, and legislative actors who are hosting their, you know, their draft policies and draft laws on GitHub as well. And Right. I mean, how how does I mean, I don't want to say what's the business model for this, but how, how does that work? And what do you see the future of that looking like? No, that, that's a wonderful question. You know, I, I think I think we've tried hard to make it clear to people that, you know, yes, GitHub is a wonderful platform to do things like develop software on, but that the platform itself is usable and versatile for many other tasks that, you know, where being able to control versions and comment on proposed changes are interesting and useful things to do. So, you know, whether that's planning a project, uh, you know, co-writing something, whether that's, you know, a bill or fiction, um, you know, there's, it's, it's, I think the, the more that I've played with it, uh, the more that I played with it in the past, the more it became clear just sort of how versatile a program it was. Um, hmm. One of the first things I did probably maybe four or five years ago when I first, you know, when, when I made my GitHub account, um, was built a set of uh, contract templates 
for an, a sort of open source project. Um, so, it, you know, as as a space to kind of host group projects, I think it's you know, applicable to a lot more things than just code. Teams that I know not nearly enough about to be talking about um, have also been building a lot of other tools to kind of try and make it a more sort of immersive environment. Um, so we have things like uh, like single page posts called gists where you can just post up sort of a single shot thing. Uh, we've got pages, which is sort of like a website hosting structure where you can have kind of like a fancy splash page that is connected to the project you're building. Hmm. Uh, so it's, it's you know, I think the types of things that are possible on GitHub have been kind of incrementally expanding over, over time. And I, I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. I got your GitHub page up in front of me and I have to bring up uh, the, I think this project that deserves some coverage, the digital natives to Indigo children Chrome extension. <laughs> <laughs> So a, a game designer friend of mine was musing on Twitter that uh, digital natives is the indigo children of the you know sort of tech buzzword uh, press, and you know I think this was had, had tweeted out oh it would be funny if someone made a, a Chrome extension that would change that. So I, I took an evening and <laughs> built it. All right. Well, uh, let's get back a little to the more professional work you're doing at, at uh, GitHub outside of the Chrome extensions. Uh, we were speaking before we started recording today about the bug bounty program at GitHub. And uh, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of background on that and your involvement in it and why it is so exciting. Yeah, uh, this, you know, for for that specific release, uh, we, we just had our five year anniversary of, of GitHub's bug bounty program back uh, sort of towards the end of February. And, you know, coincidentally, this, this was a, a uh, bug bounty legal safe harbor is a project I've been working on since quite a while before I joined GitHub. So uh, when I arrived, I saw that there were some discussions about uh, updating that uh, previously GitHub's bug bounty program and their, their safe harbor language hadn't really been changed much since around 2014. And one of the big changes in terms of kind of best practices for, for bug bounty programs and for security research in general that had taken place between 2014 and now is the emphasis and, and sort of general industry understanding of the need for a legal safe harbor has has increased significantly. Um, you know, it, it, it was the case once upon a time that the quote unquote legal protections needed for a bug bounty program were very informal and you know usually were nothing more than some casual lines here and there on, on the program page saying oh yeah you know we're not gonna you know take legal action because of this if you follow the rules and often often it was little more than that mm -hmm. um so a, a number of of both information security professionals and legal practitioners and, and legal academics uh started pushing for uh, a more robust kind of more legally enforceable version of uh, bug bounty safe harbor, and you know I I, I saw this because uh, at the time I, I was on the you know cybercrime defense practitioner side of this. You know I, I I won't name names on either side, but I I had more than one client who had had the experience of performing security research, finding something that was high value, and reporting it to a company. And then basically being told, look, if you don't do this, this, and this, uh, we're going to come after you legally, or we're going to, you know, send this on to the FBI. And, you know, I think it's just because of this current state of computer crime laws in the U.S., you know, these are things that I think the industry has, has begun to realize are not something that you can do with just kind of informal, casual you know, unenforceable guarantees. It's something where, you know, if you want people to take on the work of this research, it's kind of only fair to provide them legal protections from, you know, potential, potential retribution for beneficial work that they've tried to do. So for our listeners, why would they need legal protection for doing that kind of work? Ah, um, because the computer crime laws in the U.S. are extraordinarily broad, um, both civil and criminal. Um, you know, the type of work that goes into security research from a technical perspective, other than the fact that it's that it may be permitted by the, the program terms, you know, the 
actual physical, you know, sort of technical work is often indistinguishable from malicious action, yeah. except for the internal intents of the user. Hmm. Uh, so you have things like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the U.S., which you know, basically says that if under 1030A5A says that if you've uh, caused any impairment to the integrity or availability of data of a protected computer, that is unauthorized damage and potentially a felony, as well as um, recoverable civilly um, for the damage and loss that may have been caused. And those are you know, all very broadly defined terms, I, I think in part because you know, when this law was passed in the 1980s, people, A, were not really thinking about security research, and B, were trying to, you know, I think sort of were trying to future-proof the law, but the, you know, the flip side of that is they wrote it so broadly that a wide swath of innocent or sort of research necessary conduct is potentially criminalized unless there's a very clear authorization. So there's that law. Um, the, the, other, the other thing that comes up in this context is uh, DMCA's anti-circumvention laws, which basically say that if you have uh, circumvented a technical protection measure, and that, again, is defined incredibly broadly, <laughs> um, that is also punishable civilly or criminally under the DMCA. So my organization does a lot of work mm -hmm. on this type of stuff. So I, I have I have two questions, and you can pick your poison. One <laughs> sure, of them may be unfair. Um, sure, the, the, so the first one is always that uh, bug bounty programs often seem to get conflated with vulnerability disclosure programs, um, and that you know it's important to sort of have one or both. So I was a just sort of curious what mm -hmm. your reaction to that is, and then the the second one is um, so. My organization has longstanding been in support of bug bounty programs, um, and I'm not the expert on this, but there's always been we've always been trying to figure out how to make them better. Uh, it seems like you've been involved in substantial renovations to GitHub's program, so I guess I'm curious what's the process by which companies, and particularly GitHub, learned how the program is working and how you would improve it, and what sort of changes need to be made. Oh, sure. Those, those are great questions. Let, let me start with the first one, which is, you know, I think, yes, bug bounty programs and vulnerability disclosure programs are, you know, in, in some ways separate beasts, uh, in some ways go hand in hand. Uh, I've seen different companies do it different ways where, you know, some of them have one and not the other. Some of them have both. And some of them have a joint safe harbor provision for both. Some of them have different ones. But you know, I think in in practice, the the main difference is that with the bug bounty program, you're usually giving a little more guidance on, you know, here's what's in scope, here's what's not in scope. Um, here are some examples of you know what our payouts are for different sort of severity uh, severity levels of issues. Uh, it's oftentimes bug bounties are a little more like actively managed, whereas vulnerability disclosure programs can be a little more. Hmm say casual in terms of uh, you know just encouraging people to self-submit to a process as opposed to you know I'm thinking platforms like hacker one where you know it's kind of built around the idea of a managed actively involved bug bounty program um, so no I mean they're, they're different there's a lot of overlap and I think for the purposes of legal safe harbor a lot of the same issues a lot of the same concerns come up what are the, the big risks and challenges that you know business or an organization that's thinking of implementing a bug bounty program needs to keep in mind? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I think the thing I see done wrong most frequently in terms of people standing up bug bounty programs is, you know, at, as with most things, Satan's in the small text. Um, it comes down to getting the details right, and you know, those are not easy nor non technical questions. Um, you're trying to communicate something fairly difficult to an audience who you are encouraging to kind of test the boundaries and limits of, of a given system. An audience that very uh, well might not have legal backgrounds either. <laughs> pr precisely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it is a difficult thing for, I, 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 well, I think getting a bug bounty program set up right can be a very difficult thing if you don't have a security team who is actively communicating well with legal or a legal team that is not actively actively communicating well with security, um, because both of those aspects have to have to be done right. Um, and I guess what are the big legal pitfalls that legal needs to watch out mm -hmm. for? 
yeah, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a pitfall unique to legal. I think it's a pitfall that falls on kind of anyone tasked with involvement in this program in any sense. But one of the things that that you mentioned was, you know, the the risk of encouraging people to submit, you know, things that may actually be intended or not actual problems or maybe even intended features. Um, you know, and a lot of that comes down proactively to having the language around both the scope and the limits of the program and sort of the, like, the expectation setting language of the program itself done right in a way where people are going to read it and understand it and, you know, hopefully, uh, if you're real lucky, abide by it. Has anybody created any sort of bug bounty best practices or is there anything that you would hand people like some guidance documents on what they could do? Maybe on GitHub. I, I know. The, so, so yeah, actually, um, there, there are a few projects in the works on in that regard. Um, for for Safe Harbor specifically, there are a few people. Um, you know, I, I point to you know, not to toot my own horn too much, but but I've got a set of templates up that were the basis for what became GitHub's. It's on your um, GitHub page. Also, <laughs> it isn't my GitHub page. In fact. Um, it is not identical to what GitHub's using now, but it's you know sort of the base templates that are usable, and then that itself is, is forked from a project that uh, a security researcher named Ed Overflow put together. Um, was, was a set of templates based on uh, Amit Elazari's academic work and some other sort of best practice practice, practice examples from the field. Uh, the other the other project that both touches on Safe Harbor, but also has some templates for kind of a roll your own bug bounty or vulnerability disclosure project is a project by uh, Bug Crowd, which is a you know, kind of the other, a, a, one of the well-known sort of bug bounty host platforms, but they've got a project called Dis disclose.io. And that page, uh, which you know, is both a website and a GitHub page, um, has a lot of templates, both for Safe Harbor, as well as um, for things like, you know, here are some ideas on how to do your bug bounty scope or other aspects of that program. So there are definitely some groups working on best practices. I, I wouldn't say that there's any single canonical source for that at this point. I think there's a lot of good best pra practice examples out there. Um, I'd point to both Dropbox and Uber as other companies who are doing pretty good jobs with their bug bounty program. Hmm. But because this is something that, that you know isn't just a set and forget thing, you know, I, I think what's tricky is no matter how good the template is, it's going to be something that, you know, the individual or the company has to, you know, has to match to their needs and their capabilities as well. You know, GitHub and Uber and Dropbox are, you know, very different examples than, you know, my buddy's six person startup and they, you know, wouldn't be able to have the same kind of program. Well, I think that it's probably a good time to uh, segue towards more of a career discussion. We, you talked a little bit earlier about the, journey, the unexpected journey uh, to GitHub um, from Tor Eklund to GitHub. Before Tor Eklund, what was uh, the journey like getting from, I guess, law school to there? Yeah, so I, I, graduated, I graduated law school in 2012, and I, I had a background in international affairs and political science. So I, I'd been really interested in doing human rights work. I did, I'd done some of that through law school, uh, through uh, clinics and things like that. And for my first uh, year or so out of law school, I worked with a nonprofit uh, or a non-governmental organization called the International Legal Foundation, which does uh, sort of public defense enablement, basically, in post and mid-conflict countries. Uh, so I was I was in Afghanistan. I was in, I was in the West Bank. Um, they now have offices in uh, Tunisia and a couple other places as well. But that's that's as of a few years ago. Um, hmm. So it was fantastic work. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then, you know, the, the nature yeah, it of... Sounds incredibly fulfilling. It was. Um, and, and it was part of how I got into uh, sort of the digital privacy space. I, I, I found myself crossing some, uh, let's say, very hotly disputed international borders with large collections of very sensitive client files and interview notes and things like that. And, uh, you know, got myself up to speed very quickly on how to protect that information as best I could from you know, both surveillance and interception. Uh, so it, it, it was personally very fulfilling. Uh, professionally, it, it became difficult just because, you know, the nature of international contracts being what they were. Those projects ran up. They didn't have anything more for me. Um, 
I landed as, at a small firm in New York doing uh, civil identity theft litigation. So another thing kind of at the at this intersection of law and technology and, you know, a, if you ever want a really dystopian deep dive into the ways that algorithmic automated systems can destroy people's lives, uh, look up some civil uh, federal credit reporting act cases and there's some great examples oh, in there. It's, it's a, we're um, recording this on a Friday afternoon. That sounds like a path to the dark side. <laughs> it absolutely is. Um, so I, I, I was there again for about a year, and then um, Tor Eklund was hiring. The, I, thought, I thought doing cybercrime defense work sounded like a very interesting space to get into, and moved over there from you know kind of this pathway towards uh, sort of technology litigation. So, I mean, I, I guess... Uh, like, what, what do you think? What's your five-year plan? Or was any of this part of a five-year plan? I, I'm, I've been torturing interns with that question for the past few weeks, so I feel like I should <laughs> ask more seasoned um, professionals what, what, where they are on that question. Yeah, um, if you'd asked me a year ago, I don't know that I would have had any, a good answer to that question. Um, but you know, I, I think five-year plans are tricky because you know a, a lot changes in a year, and you know a lot comes up, a lot shifts. Um, but you know, I, I think my my my, my rough five year plan. Um, the one thing that that I kept running into in private practice uh, in the technology space was the realization that you know I'm I'm dealing with all of these larger tech companies, but don't really have any concept of what that looks like from inside, um, and felt like the kind of compliance side internal process was a bit of a blind spot for me professionally. Um, so GitHub has been a fantastic space to, to start learning that, to kind of get up to speed on, you know, what a lot of this uh, looks like inside when the sausage is getting made, not just, you know, how it looks in the butcher shop. Yeah, but I mean, still, it's, you know, the sausage that you're making is like organic, free range, happy cow sausage. Like, you know, if to, to talk about like, in, you know, the, the business side, the, the tech companies that you could go to, you know, I put GitHub right up there with like Mozilla as far as, you know, very cool privacy forward copy left forward, you know, progressive tech companies uh, that seems like just a, I don't know, you know, and you get an opportunity to get that in-house experience, but still at a place where it's doing advocacy work, which just sounds. Oh, absolutely. Like no, it, it, it's been fantastic in that way. And, you know, I think one big factor that, that had me choosing GitHub over some other places was, you know, he, here is a space that really seems to stand up for its user base and, you know, be advocating towards things that are really, really pro user and pro sharing and pro content. And, you know, with, with the laws being where they are, I, I think, the more large actors doing that kind of advocacy work, the better. And there's, there's not nearly enough of them. Yeah. So I think that this is just about it for the time we have today. Fred, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to bring back uh, an element of our, our segment of our show that we have not gotten the opportunity to talk about this season so far, but that is uh, to ask what's on your bookshelf or what, what's on your bedside table right now as you're reading. Oh, um, so I'm trying to think if, there, if there's anything even remotely law adjacent on, on my bedside table right now. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I, I put that stuff, you know, I keep that in the office. My, right. my, my reading list is all sci-fi right now. That's, that's fair. Um, certainly for my like fun escapist reading, it's been a lot of sci-fi recently, but um, I, I, I try and split it up between like one fun escapist fiction book and one or two nonfiction or skills books. Uh, the, the nonfiction book I've been reading that's sort of on my, uh, it's, it's an ebook, so I guess it's at least digitally on, on my bookshelf, um, is I, I've been slowly making my way through Carl Jung's Red Book, which um, you know, I think if I'm going to tie that back to law, uh, when I think of the trial work I've done, you know, mythology and storytelling are, are two of the most powerful sort of sources for, for that work. And, you know, I, I would say that storytelling aspect comes into a lot of, you know, advocacy work in almost any any realm is going to benefit fit from that. Um, so this has been a lot of sort of very personal musings by Jung on you know his professional path, his his views on sort of mythology and, and the human psyche. And I don't know, it's, it's been a fun read so far. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Fred. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This has been an episode of Tech Policy Grind, a podcast from the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. 
We're a collection of early career professionals paving the way in the tech policy world, and we really hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you just heard, it would be a huge help and mean a lot to us if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and a review. If you don't have iTunes, maybe just share the show with a friend. We want to thank Ali Sternberg for producing the intro and outro music for the show, and thank you all for listening. So, until next time, thanks.